did, did somebody make a map of Leoman's secure shelter? Yes. Yeah, so uh, one of my players, oh, my wife, taking a break from D&D after her character got permed. So the robot that she built, her character built, um, is taking over her spot for a little while. Uh, it's her good friend, uh, Chris Beasley, uh, playing a warforged cleric, cleric um, of knowledge, I think. And his deity is my wife's PC Jinx. So okay. all all of like the spiritual weapons or Jinxes, the spiritual uh, the guardian spirits are all little Jinxes. Um, okay. He did he did a. Uh, Wait, did a, is Jinx a deity? To him, and that's really all that matters, right? Well, it's your campaign. You can run it how you want. <laughs> um, and so, like, they did a divination ritual, and so they sacrificed a set of a tinkerer's tools so that has the components for the spell. Um, and we were mentioning like that they were going to use Lehman's tiny hut to. Like, you know, take a long rest. I mean, it's a great and spell. I, I love that it's spell. It's an amazing spell, yeah. Yeah. So I was like, I really need to get a, a map for, like, Lehman's Tiny Hut for them. You yeah. Know? I mean, I guess you, I'd have to read the actual wording on the spell. Like, is, I, so, I guess yeah. it's possible to have combat in there. I mean, I know if the PCs got in a fight, you could. So sure, make a map of but, it. Why not? It just it's just as like the swap too. Like uh, a lot of other players uh, that I DMs I know that use Foundry and VTTs have a long rest screen. You yeah, know, with, uh, yeah, yeah. But anyways, I'm Christopher. Your oh yeah yeah I'm Jay. I'm Jay I'm Jay. Hi guys. For <laughs> for anyone playing. who for anyone who's never listened to us who started on episode I don't know seventy or wherever the hell we're at. You'd be surprised, but we get new listeners every week because of all the Adventure League stuff that I've been running. Fair enough. Welcome Go back. The start, start, start. Masters. Uh-oh. Oh, new theme song. What's this? <laughs> Episode 70. I got a new theme song. <laughs> that works. The next theme song is going to be like one of those K-pop songs. <laughs> I, I need some K-pop friends of mine to, to make us a proper grumpy dungeon master theme song we already have two great outros so i I think we're good there but we need a good intro yeah i mean truthfully we could use a new intro we've been running hit and smash for a long time oh it's a great it's a great intro it really is but i think we need something grumpy dungeon masters maybe maybe if someone helps us out and we'll do something at 100 yeah yeah that's that's kind of what i'm thinking so you got like Anybody who's musically inclined who can actually create you know, a, a proper intro for us. You got about 30 episodes before we need a new oh, intro. It's more a good than work. half a year. <laughs> <laughs> get to work. That goes by very quickly. So, yeah. Um, almost the end of 2021. Uh, overall, how is your D&D year treating you? It's been really good over the course of the year. Uh, is this is this what we're doing? Are we going to do a recap of the year? No, I just felt like asking. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, like I started my... Well, I, I guess it was last year when I started the new campaign. Uh, yeah. Jeez, when the hell was it? No, actually, no, it would have been this year because I got my vaccine in May or a- April or May. So that's when I started up the new campaign. It was around then. And mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's still going. And... For as long as I've been running it, my players are level six. <laughs> You'd expect them to be higher level, but no, they're they're only level six. I've been keeping it artificially low on purpose. Yeah, I um uh, I messed up leveling the characters. I think for the uh, Al campaign, and, like there's like giant gaps between like three and four, and then like five and six, mm. and then they would like to six and then to seven like four 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 weekends later um eh, it happens and they'll, they'll pretty much they'll, uh, the next dungeon they go through i think they'll hit eight yeah, yeah. Uh, all of my all of my players actually hit level seven after last night i just forgot to tell them before we wrapped up so so you're well, hearing it here right now you're all level seven congratulations yeah all my guys are seven they'll be eight when they go fight the final boss which um, I would have actually uh, released what it was and who it is yeah. uh, this episode, but I was missing two players. So I kind of thawed out this whole episode. 
players did some really good role play in in town with trying to buy items and whatnot. Yep. And um, was able to delay that reveal. I just I was able to see it really good, and then next episode next week will be the full reveal of the boss. I've already asked all the players like what they thought the end boss is and what their thoughts are. Yep. One of them guessed right. All right. It was me. <laughs> no, it was definitely it was definitely not me because I already know what the end boss is and I'm not playing in your game. Well, the funny part is that not only did he guess the end boss, but they were like, and that one thing at the very beginning of the campaign when we first played in the very first dungeon, that's this thing, right? I was like, oh, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Could be. Maybe. <laughs> so I, I I really liked I really like the player that I have, Dimitri, who knows all of D and D, all the monsters. He's he's memorized it all. But he has he has a wonderful knack of not being able to take that stuff into play. Yeah. Um so even even to the character's detriment, which is something that it's kinda of hard to find. Like we're we're lucky being on like you know plot for like LARPs and stuff like that. Like we we're pretty good at finding that line and towing that line. Oh, you um, have to, you have to be if you're yeah running staff at a LARP. <laughs> yeah, and so like there was one time in uh, uh, Frost Maiden where he was like, "I'm gonna do this, this, and this, and then run in there. I'm gonna try to trick him." And at the end of doing the whole thing, I was like, "That's a pretty good plan." And then he goes. But it's not gonna work because this guy has true sight, and then he rolls his dice. <laughs> yep. I was but like, his, his oh, character yeah. doesn't know that. <laughs> it does have true sight. It doesn't work. Yeah. See, that's the that's always the thing about running other dungeon masters because Dimitri's a he's a DM too, isn't he? Yeah, I think yeah, he's done a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you know, once you've been a dungeon master, you you learn the behind the scenes of everything. That's just yeah. sort of the way it is. You you end up with information that your character would not know. So you yeah. sort of have to you sort of have to play pretend, you know. That's why I always like to play like whether the RPG is Dungeons and Dragons or like I'm playing Fallout or Skyrim or something like that. I like creating a set of rules for my character that they have to follow. So like the last time I played through Fallout 4, I played the Thaladrid character that I always play, right? right. And so I'm going to go all melee, no ranged weapons. Um, I usually allow a, a tiny weapon for like pulling creatures. It's not stupid, you know? Yeah. Like if I can pull that creature back some, I can fight it one-on-one. So, all right. But I'm not going to snipe with that character. Sure. And it's an, it's an anti-undead character. Okay. But there's no, really no undead in Fallout 4, right? No. Make it anti are maybe. But there are ghouls. Oh, there you go. Ghouls. <laughs> and ghouls are as close to undead as you can get in Fallout 4. So he has a rule. He has to kill all ghouls on sight. All right. So, so let's just say that every time I go into town and there's a ghoul NPC in there, things get crazy. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it's like, oh, geez, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, the fact that there, I mean, hell, there's entire towns that are nothing but ghouls. I lay waste to them all. Uh, yeah, well... Makes things interesting. And Fallout's one of those games where you can kill all of them and still complete the game. So. Yep. Uh, the first the first ghoul that I actually ran across was actually on a quest. Like, I was doing some weird side quest and I have to go find this doctor to save this family. And when I find the doctor, she's a ghoul. I remember. And I, and I was like, whoa. I didn't even know the, this ghoul was here. She goes, ah, you've never seen a ghoul before? Nope. Dead. <laughs> <laughs> But I've killed Quest a lot failed. of them. Yep. <laughs> Quest failed. All right. It's too bad for that family. <laughs> yep. They'll get over it. Or not. Yeah, they'll they'll be dead. Uh the the kid that's stuck in the fridge. Uh, <laughs> Please, I, sir, I'm... can you let me out of the fridge? And you open the fridge and it's a little ghoul child, you're like oh, uh, you console did. command kill children. <laughs> Blam! <laughs> Solves that problem. <laughs> now I don't have to find your parents. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, yeah. It, it's it's basically taking a game and just adding hard mode or you know just some other restrictions to it. We all do but, it. But it's it's what I do whenever I play a public player because like I know as a DM that I know all the the things and the tactics and the rules. And I'm not going to question the DM because the DM is, is running the game. If this doesn't work right now, then this doesn't work right now. 
So you just know, might, uh, the character won't a, know. As a sort of an example, I was playing a barbarian in the pirate campaign. Uh, he is a follower of Grimnar, who is basically the god of strength and battle, you know, and so forth. But Grimnar is notorious for just going melee on things. So <laughs> I play the character with a giant great sword, and I have two hand axes, and that is it. So if something can fly the hell away from me, well, I, you know, I'll throw a couple axes at it, and then I just have to stand there and twiddle my thumbs. The smart <laughs> thing to do would obviously be to buy a bow, and you know, because barbarians can use bows just fine. But that's that's not what Grimnar would do. Yeah. I, I've gone back and forth on that for some characters, like the Thaldry character. He's definitely not a ranged character, but he's also a fighter. Uh, he's he's a knowledgeable, you know, yeah. military soldier. So he that would be in his repertoire of shooting things, you know. But that's just not going to be how it's going to die. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could have a massive longbow. <laughs> yeah. walk, walk around with a ballista on your back. <laughs> <laughs> just like one of those like those creatures you always see in fantasy, just with a ballista mounted. You're like you crawl, you fall down over, a little midget on your back fires the ballista. <laughs> yeah, like a <I'm>, blaster blaster. <laughs> I'm watching. Uh, I started watching the second Dungeons and Dragons movie. Uh, oh like the, yeah, the live action one, Wrath of the Dragon God. I think it's called. And yeah. I, I keep it expecting it to be at some point like those super cheesy 80 movies. I really am expecting them to have some guy who's walking around with a cr- giant crossbow on his back that when they get into a fight with a dragon, just sort of pulls it out, sets up a tripod and just fucking goes, you know, like shooting 30 shots with this thing. It, <laughs> like it's so cheesy and bad that that's what I keep expecting. Hasn't, I haven't seen it yet, but maybe. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of those, a lot of the '80s films were just terrible, like that. Mm-hmm. But that's what made them great. It, I agree. I mean, Krull, Krull is fantastic, and if you've never seen it, go watch it because it's so bad, it's so good. I don't, I don't think I've sat down and seen Krull not as an adult. I remember seeing it as a kid. Mm-hmm. All I remember is the Cyclops getting crushed by the door. Yep, yeah, that was that was that, one that's part. That's all of it. that I know. That's that's all that I know. I don't know anything else about Kroll other than there's a Cyclops and he's holding a door. Yep. And then he gets squished. He does get squished. He does, in <laughs> fact, get squished. Uh, so, I, I, yeah. So I finally have figured out what I'm doing for my New Year's Eve, or I guess it'll be New Year's Day game, actually, because New Year's falls on a Saturday this yeah. year. So we're, we're not doing anything the two weeks before that because of a party and because of Christmas because Christmas Day is on Saturday. But for New Year's, I'm going to run a one-shot. And I've decided I'm actually going to run Street Fighter. Uh-huh. So, like, Street Fighter, the tabletop. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's all, that's all I got right now. It, you know, it came out back in the late 90s, probably. Late 90s, early 2000s thousand somewhere around there is made by white wolf which is the same company they did vampire and werewolf and all those games but cool. i have i haven't run this game in a couple decades probably <laughs> so you got plenty of time to learn it up i mean truthfully it's not a hard system i still know exactly how to run all the white wolf games because they all ran on the same system so it won't be very difficult to figure it out uh hardest part's going to be character doing character creation okay well good luck with that i'm running the uh christmas my christmas one shot which is currently on sale for five dollars when are you uh, running it on the 18th yep running it on the 18th okay um we got a few guests that are coming on to, to play it oh sweet um trying to find some more but i'll follow the normal players and then we just decided to take christmas and new year's off so we yeah. won't be streaming either of those two days yeah um Understandable. Yeah. I, I, but we'll we'll have to talk about it. But it's possible for all the listeners that we might not have a podcast one of those days because Christmas time it gets busy. So yeah, but we'll do our best. Even if it's just yep. me reciting crazy lyrics into the mic. Yeah, or or you something. could you could just sit here and have a one sided conversation with Craig and yeah, Gu- and, and Giark, who still has never said anything. I did get him a bib, though. Do you see? I see. I see. That's a nice, is that a lobster bib? It is. 
I went to Red Lobster. I got some cheddar biscuits. Oh, you lucky son of a... Love some <laughs> cheddar biscuits. That's a, I mean, they keep saying that it's Red Lobster. and like, I would assume they have lobster there, but all I ever see on the menu is just cheddar biscuits. You should have, honestly, you should have just named the place Cheddar Biscuits and people would still show up. You could probably even do without the sit-down restaurants. Just have little... Hell, just, just do food carts where you sell as Cheddar Biscuits. You'd make so much money. One of those like, like uh, ice cream trucks that just yeah. <laughs> rolls around the neighborhoods on cheddar yeah. biscuits. Yeah, it's just playing like the ice cream music. Do, 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 do. Everybody comes running up, cheddar biscuits. They um, would make so much money. This is, this is definitely not D&D related, but it's definitely a fun story I'd like to tell. Um, we were driving home, me and my daughter, and she was like, did you get me an ice cream at the store? I was like, no, I didn't get ice cream at the store. I promised you ice cream, and I'm sorry I didn't get you ice cream. I was like, I'll, I'll get you some ice cream tomorrow, I promise. And she started crying um, because you're five, and that's ice cream. Yeah, I mean, every, every world. everything in your world at that point is over with. Life sucks, you know. So on the way home from the store, we just happened to get behind an ice cream truck. Yes. So I was like... <laughs> What happens if I just follow this guy? I mean, he's probably driving around the neighborhood, so I'll just wait till he gets his next neighborhood and you know does a stop, and I'll uh, get some ice cream. Yeah. So I follow him for like three blocks, and he turns down into like a cul-de-sac where there's no way to go, and he pulls over to the side of the road, and I pull over to the side of the road, and I get out of my car <laughs> and I run up to his to his van, and he's like, "What are you doing? Why are you following?" He's like, "Can I buy some ice cream?" He's like, "Yeah, okay, I, I guess." <laughs> So I was like, I need, I need this and this and this. And he's like, all right, it's going to be like 15 bucks. I pull out a 20 and slap it down. Like, thank you. And I run back in my car. Um, <laughs> it's just, <yeah. laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't even know how to handle that. Like, I, don't know. I, I, I probably would have done the same thing if I were you, especially <laughs> yeah. if I had a small child that wanted ice cream. Yeah. Uh, if I'm that guy, you know, that's that's a little weird, but all right. But he isn't. He's in a he's in a truck with a window, right? Like with the side mm-hmm. window to sell ice cream. Yeah, but the music wasn't playing or anything like that. Eh. <laughs> so, I don't know. Maybe he's going home. It's like I'm done for the evening. I didn't make any money, Martha. Uh, but the last guy <laughs> made five bucks. Yep. This guy <laughs> stopped over and paid me fifteen dollars for a dollar fifty worth of ice cream. <laughs> Yeah, that's well. I don't know because like you go to the store, you spend like five bucks on like the 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 red, white, and blue popsicles. Yeah, you know, and they're you know okay, okay, five bucks you get a whole bunch, but they're all like small things. But like the one that he gave me that was also five dollars, the one was like as big as like a tennis ball tube. The thing was massive. Yeah, but they buy these, they, they, to... they buy these things wholesale, man. Like they, yeah. they barely pay anything. I, I know when I was working for Domino's Pizza, and mind you, this has been you know more than a decade. It's been a while. But when I worked for Domino's Pizza, we were charging seven dollars a pizza or something like that, and we literally would have thirty two cents into the whole pizza. Yeah. Now I I'm sure I'm sure these guys are smaller time than Domino's, but they're still paying less than a buck for one of those. Yeah. Fair enough. Um. So this is not ice cream and uh, wholesale. Yes, <laughs> this is the yeah. podcast. Yes, we we now do a business podcast. Apparently, um, I was at the uh, I was at a Zenergy this weekend, and they were having a customer appreciation sale. Like everything was like twenty percent off, and oh, lucky, um, yeah, and like you could get up there, and there was other tables just full of stuff. There was like thirty percent off, forty percent off, um. All the magic cards were like discounted. Everything in the store, like I said, everything in the store twenty percent off, including all the singles. Yeah, I'm I'm actually um, very glad I'm not around there because I don't I don't. Hi, here's my paycheck. Yeah, I, I yeah, didn't yeah. cash it to the bank. You're just gonna get it anyway. So here you go. Yep. Um, I did buy. Uh, let me get it here because it's fifteen pounds. Oh, 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 goodness. Ugh. I got. Ugh. Okay, so yeah, they the the box. Uh, I guess they're books actually, uh, yes. but they they look 
they're hardbound books that look exactly like the first edition or actually these would be D D basic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they look like the old ones. Got the same cover art, the same colors. Uh, the Temple of yeah. Elemental, Middle Evils, the black one. Yep. And like I said, it has that, that old cover to it. There's two massive tomes on the inside for the, the entire adventure from beginning to end. Um, I saw this and um, I was I really wanted it. Uh, and I was going to buy it online. And then I saw that Synergy had expanded their uh rpg section and included other things like starfinder and a couple cobalt press things and they had that as well so i uh i picked it up and i mean i can't blame you it's it's really nice looking it look real nice yeah. on a shelf oh yeah i'm looking oh, yeah. at some of the interior art uh, yeah that's that's nice i'm uh running out of shelf space oh i noticed i noticed it since i helped increase your uh election that puts you pretty much over the top there yep uh well after you came and, and delivered me all those first and second edition books uh dimitri again parking back to him gave me his pathfinder stuff we talked about that last week so I, yeah. i'm even more i have a stack of books to the right of me now that i have no idea where to put so lovely yeah, i'm kind of over encumbered oh so i you know, because I picked up a whole bunch of the second edition stuff, some of the basic D and D, and some first edition stuff. So I actually got to use some of it this past weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, like I picked up all of that stuff, and it included two books. The uh, I think it's the Book of Layers or the Tome of Layers, and there were two of them. And I, I love these things. I wish they would do them for fifth edition, but they work just fine in you know the ones I've got. And basically, it's like a page or two of a monster encounter. So as an example, there was one of them for an Ifrit. I already knew where my players were at. They were in a volcano, and I wanted them to have an interaction with an Ifrit. So this thing mm -hmm. actually had a detailed, exactly like you would find in a module, but a detailed interaction with combat and everything within a Ifrit. So I, you know, all I had to do is use the fifth edition stats for it. Um, you know, they're sixth level, so I nerfed it down a good bit. But it just seems so much more creative to me, at least than what I see in a lot of the fifth edition stuff. Uh, in fifth edition, I know that the Afrit is going to be super limited into what it can actually do, based upon what's in that monster manual. You know, like it, it has access, I think, to major image. Which is a uh, you know, it's a spell that allows illusions, but Major Image still has extreme limitations in Fifth Edition. Mm -hmm. So I pulled more of what was in the the actual uh, Tome of Layers, and what it was is they enter the room, and it looks like they're standing on a ledge, and out in the middle over the volcano, like over the uh, lava pit, is a floating circular disc of bronze or brass. And then the uh the Afrit is sitting on a throne in the middle of it. He's like twenty four feet tall. And he waves his hand and a gondola of fire appears, floats across. The players can actually step on it and then come over to where he's at. That is not possible within fifth edition rules. Yeah, okay. it's just it just isn't. Major image does not allow you to do something that complex or that large. So I just went ahead and ran with it anyway and did it, and the encounter was pretty freaking awesome. Uh, the truth of it is, it's just a giant illusion. The Ifrit is much smaller than 24 feet. He's invisible and hiding in the back of the room, just sort of controlling this thing. And finally, the players figured out that it was just an illusion, uh, and then he attacks them after they figure it out, and then they just you know, stomp the hell out of him. <laughs> but it was it was a fun fun little encounter uh, some of the players were figuring it out figuring out that it was an illusion at different rates so the one uh, player he ends up figuring out this is not real so he steps off of the platform over the lava to verify that his assumptions are correct one of the other players had not successfully figured it out so he actually sees his friend plummet into the lava and die. 
<laughs> so you know he's having a fucking conniption fit and breaking down. Then the at that point when the uh, Ifrit attacked and he's like, oh, okay, this is not real. All right, let's let's do this. But the, like the whole thing turned out to be fun and, and very creative. It was something that I just don't see a lot of in fifth. That reminds me, I used uh, your uh, armchair of relaxation in my game. <laughs> Fuck yeah, you, it, that's, that sucks that you used it before me. <laughs> <laughs> so when they when they got into the uh, Formorian Mage's study hall, they're pretty much just books surrounding all the walls and his table with his tome that he's working on. And there's like a set of pillows and stuff in the back. Okay? Yeah. And pretty much so the giant like 10 foot by 10 foot pillow that he uses kind of like as a bed or whatnot. I was like, you know what? That's, that's, that's the cushion of restfulness. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the cushion of restfulness. I would have gone with the bean bag of restfulness. <laughs> so uh, you spend 10 minutes sitting in it. You're transported away into an, an, the, uh, an ethereal plane for one minute and you come back fully rested. All right. That's the short of it. Yep. And the best part was too, is that when he walked into the room, um, one of the players was like, you know what? I'm just going to sit here on this cushion and you guys do what you want to do. I'm done. Because <laughs> he, he messed up a ritual. He was he was just done. The character, the PC was done. The player was having fun. Yeah. Um, so then Beasley, with his Warforged, was like, all right, I'm going to ritual cast a tech magic. And so I just picture like the Warforged just like dances. I don't know why that's what the ritual is. Like they kind of like, just do the monkey. <laughs> like Johnny Bravo. Yeah. For 10 minutes. And then now they can see to, see magic items. Does so, the beavers and butthead dance? <laughs> I don't know why that always pops in my head, but that's what it, that's what I always see. So he's there. He, he does it. He finishes, and immediately the moment he finishes, the cushion glows, and then and then the, the other person, cushion and another person out. just disappear from existence. And yep. Beasley just went like, ah, oh, f. <laughs> it was <laughs> it was great. And he's like, I knew it. I knew something was bad in this room. I knew we're, something bad was going to happen, and something bad happened. It's my first day on the job, and <laughs> everyone's dying. Fired. <laughs> and uh, after a minute, he came back. They left it there. They they, they contemplated dragging this giant <laughs> ten foot cushion home with them. I mean, I would have. Yeah. I, I hey, look, my, my player stole that mirror. Yeah, you know, it, it's like a seven foot high, a seven foot high, three foot wide mirror. You know, but they, they stole that damn thing, threw it in the back of a wagon, and hauled it across town. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, if you, could, if you could steal the bean bag, do it. Hey guys, Chris here, hopping in the middle of the podcast to give you all of our announcements. Be sure to watch our live stream every Saturday at Twitch, uh, twitch.tv forward slash Grumpy Dungeon Masters at 8 p.m. Make sure to visit our website, GrumpyDungeonMasters.com, and order yourself one of our gift packs of Grumpy Dungeon Master dice. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Grumpy Dungeon Masters. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at, at Grumpy DMs on Twitter. Be sure to check out our new buddies, Fate Awakens, on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Fate Awakens. And also be sure to tune in every Friday at 4 p.m. when they release their new live play D&D session of their homebrew campaign. As always, be sure to check out Zenergy Gamers at zenergy gamers.com. Use code word grumpy for 5% off any online order. Anything else to add, Jay? Uh, nope. Just over here dancing on TikTok. All right. Yeah, so just to let you know, yeah, I took that idea, ran with it. It's my idea now. I was, yep. I was the first to implement it, first to bring it to the market. So. Yeah, you got there before I did. So <laughs> it, it is what it is. Um, but yeah. The Owl campaign is going to probably end in February. That's my guess. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, if you're about to do a big reveal for the final boss here, it should be sort of entering the final stages. Yeah. Um, what, are you, what are you running after? I may take a break, like an extended break. I may actually have uh, my other, one of my players run a D&D game. Like, okay. they host it. Now, we're still doing something on Saturdays, but... Um, but I I need a break. <laughs> I doing I Adventures it. League and doing I I need to write more stuff, and I'm doing a lot of planning stuff, and I want to start. I want to publish the Owl campaign, 
So I need a, I needed to devote my time to getting that all done. Yeah. Um, I've been wanting you, to finish Dread since July, and I am halfway through that. I mean, you're you're running two games a week without pretty much, and every Saturday without you know fail. Yeah. So I get it. Uh, like I I have a second DM that we basically swap every other week, so I have you know that little cushion to refresh myself. Yeah. And like I said, I, I don't want to get burned out. I want to keep this thing going and growing and whatnot. And um, we also have uh, Scarab coming up in January. Mm-hmm. So that's going to take up a weekend. Um, Do we know what the date is for it that? It is the Martin Luther King weekend. All right. Where is it? Uh, yeah, tell everybody where it is. Yeah, I wasn't ready for this. <laughs> Just well, well, we'll find out, and then we'll inform everybody. It's in South Carolina, right? Yeah, it's like near Columbia, I believe. Okay. Uh, um, I, maybe I'll be there. Maybe not. Don't know yet, but I'm sure you'll be there. I will. I will at least be there. Um, I know we're planning on running uh, um, a Saturday game there with a bunch of special guests. So we'll see how that goes. We'll have more information leading up to it. That's. It is coming close. Probably should be promoting this a lot more than right now. Yep. Well, uh, you're hearing it here first. <laughs> first first on, uh... on, on, on the podcast. Uh, yeah. So apparently there's a convention coming up in January in South Carolina. Probably January near 14th, Columbia. January 14th to the 17th. Um, what? Post. No. Where's the, where's, where's the, where's the you could tell you could tell we were really planning on talking about this on the podcast. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, it's in it's in it's in uh it's in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh it's at a Holiday Inn Express. It's like, you know, their giant like little convention center they have there. Um Fort Jackson. Fort Jackson, all right. Oh, it's Holiday Inn Express Fort Jackson at Garner's Ferry. It's in Garner's Ferry Road, Columbia, South Carolina. But I, it, one of our friends from the LARP runs it, owns it, something. I don't know. He'll he'll be, he'll be playing the game, but we'll be there for at least uh, Saturday and Sunday. Um, I'll be there at least Saturday and Sunday, uh, just running games. So. Yep. <clears throat> so if you can make it, come out, play some games. Uh, if I am there, I will be playing games, might be running some board games. Pretty sure I won't be running any D and D or tabletop, but yep. Cause I don't, I don't really run tabletop games for other people. <laughs> Only Not my own. Me. Group. Uh, it, like if you showed up for a game or something, sure. You could join in, but it's gotta be people. I know that's, that's the only ones I'm comfortable running for. Fair enough. Uh, we might be adding a new person to my own group, however. One of my players has sort of dropped off the face of the earth recently. So I'm, I have a new, I have another slot open, and some, some of my other players know a guy who's looking to get into a game. So I know a guy. Yep. They, they know a guy. I don't know the guy, but, you know, if he shows up and plays, then I'll know the guy. That makes sense. I know a guy. No, not really. All right, good. <laughs> um, so there's been no real D and D news from Watsi. Um, well, they kind of just shipped out their books late. And they shipped out his bands. Um, Strict Strict Save comes out yeah. Tuesday. Um, I forgot to pre-order it again at my local game store. Make sure you're buying the game. Listen, let me let me just level with you audience i know you can go to amazon and you can get the book for 36 dollars. i know you know this we all know this but go to your brick and mortar store give them the 14 extra dollars and just buy it for the 50 dollar msrb price yep. go to his energy use the cobra company get five percent off talk talk to the person behind the register just say hey can you price match amazon i mean it's kind of kind of a dick thing to do but at least the store is getting money there and not Jeff Bezos. Yep. I, I, I was, I've always found that funny. Like Jeff Bezos is some kind of weird gold dragon. 
that he's oh, yeah. the one that immediately gets the profit off it. He purchases it like on Amazon. I mean, <laughs> look, level. I, I, I hate you there. I, I'm like everybody else. I hate Amazon, but there are certain things that I utilize it for uh, specifically because I run a, I, I ship a lot of stuff. You know, yeah. With, with what I do. So getting supplies for shipping is necessary. Some things I get from Amazon, some things I get from other places, depending on prices. Uh, but yeah. when it comes when it comes to D and D stuff or gaming stuff, no, I I will always buy from my local store if at all possible. And, and my D like my D and D books and stuff that they get at my local gaming store, they're always a week late. They're they're never here on time just because of supply chain issues. But I'm still gonna I'll, I'll wait that extra week just to keep them in business. It's yep. so it's worth it for me. Yep, it's worth it. Yeah, support local businesses, especially well, the game stores. Ones. Yeah, not yeah. I mean, ones. look if they're if they're bad, they're they're not going to stay in business for long anyway. If, if you have a pizzeria there that seems to be run by the bomb, wink, wink, support it because you don't want that power vacuum to exist. You just turn to turf warfare and everything will go crazy. Some more support your local mob pizzeria. Yes, God, I love pizza. Don't uh, buy from Domino's. Never buy from Little Caesars. I, unless, oh, you, unless hey, you want hey, to sponsor hey. us, hey, then don't please buy from Little Caesars. <laughs> yeah, don't 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 shit talk Little Caesars. I will pay five dollars for a pepperoni anytime when my heartburn allows me. <laughs> this is now a pizza based podcast. <laughs> I know we're we're all over the place tonight. It's because there hasn't been much D and D news lately. Yeah. Uh, I did um, watch I actually watched a video recently on the attunement system. Uh, yeah. so you you know how I sort of detest the the attunement system, the fact yeah. that you you can only have three slots if you're an artificer you get four, uh, and I know I've told you I sort of run my own homebrew where basically uh -huh. at at tenth level you get an extra slot at twentieth level you get an extra slot, uh, right? Yeah, which it negates that a little bit, but the the video was kind of neat. It gave a bunch of different options for the magic item attunement system. Uh, one of them, I know you've heard of the idea of this one before, is just allowing an, an amount of attunement slots equal to your proficiency modifier. Yeah, Star and Wars is that one. Does it? Okay. Yeah, like, I, honestly, that's probably what you know, they should do. Like, WotC should just implement that, because that's a way better system than you get three items. Doesn't matter if you're level one or level 20, you get three items. I, I'm... Continue. I'll, I'll give my feedback at the end. Sure. Uh, let's see. What was one of the other ones that they had? Uh, this one was kind of ridiculous. It, it was you could you get the requisite three, and then whatever your intelligence modifier is, you can get another one. So if you have a plus one, you know, plus one intelligence, you get an extra plus two and two extra, and so forth. I would uh, actually, that, I would actually base that up to quick. My quick note would be this: I actually base that off a of con. I don't see. I don't feel attunements is an intelligence thing. I think it's a constitution thing. Yeah, I, I could see. Uh, honestly, I kind of agree with your sentiment on that. I don't like either of those as particular systems for it. But if I was going to do that, yeah, con probably makes more sense. Uh, the last one, and this is the one that I used to run with, and I wouldn't mind going back to at some point, but just not have the attunement system. <laughs> just allow people to use whatever magic items they can get a hold of because you as the DM, you control what comes into the game. So, so the problem with the last one is that that's how 4th edition worked. That's fourth how every edition, edition was, worked until 5th. Okay, well, I didn't know that. So 4th yes. edition was basically like, you can get as many magic items as you want. Here's your stupid humanoid character sheet. With all the slots that you have that you could fill it, fill it full of magic items. You got a whole fill with the magic item. Mm -hmm. And what it became, especially once you reached level 12, I believe. No, it was earlier than that. It was level 6. The game was balanced off the fact that you would have at least a plus 1 sword, a plus 1 armor, and a plus 1 accessory. To giving you plus two to your AC, plus one to saves, and plus one to your attack and damage. The game was designed around that, so much so that when they did their essentials version, like the 4.5e essentially, that they 
had an option to basically have that stuff automatically just add into your character character stats in case you wanted to run a low magic campaign. Because if you ran a low magic campaign using the 4th edition stats, your characters would die because they would fall behind the curve so drastically they couldn't get past 12. Yeah, well, 5th is not 4th. It's it's right. not it's not that heavily weighted on magic items. As right. if I if I recall correctly, it is not weighted on magic items whatsoever. So, I, I believe that's I believe that's true. Um, I like I like how fifth does it. I I kind of adhere to the mentality of less is more. Um, like when I was younger, I hated the fact that the Final Fantasy White and Black Mage had spell slots. Okay. Like, oh my god, why why can I only cast X Doom once a day? Why do I gotta use a cabin to cast X Doom again? And now that I'm thirty years older, um I like I like the spell slot system. It, it it gives a lot more tactical thought to it. And that's kind of how I view view attunements too. It's like you have these three slots. Not everything is a tunable, which is which is the saving grace, which makes yeah. it worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you, if you're gonna have you know like minor or uncommon items and stuff, a lot of those do not require yeah. attunement. But none of like the the plus weapons, like the the, the common and rare plus weapons, require attunement. Uh, unless they do fancy things, then they do require attunement, which is what I like. I like that. That way, you can still have your plus one mace and your plus one shield. You don't have to attune to it, but if that shield, you know, cast the daylight spell, well, you're gonna have to give him a tune slot for that. Now, is that shield worth an attunement slot when you have three other magic items that are better, bigger, better, and better? And that kind of gets to the strategy, and that's that comes that starts that affects my character's customization. You know, I'm playing I'm playing Thaladred, okay. One of his slots in fifth edition is is a flail of warning, okay. He's not the most perceptive person on the face of the planet. But the last thing that's going to happen to him is going to get, he's someone's going to get the jump in on him. He knows how critical that is from a military standpoint, not to be the one caught in a surprise attack. So to him, having a weapon, that's not even a plus one just makes it so you can't be surprised, you know? Yeah. It is worth an attunement slot to him. And that's a heavy investment to both the character and what he does, you know? And there's a couple other things, and there's some uncommon ones as well too, like the the helm of dread that makes his eyes glow red. Yeah, but that one I don't think requires attunement. Yeah, it doesn't require do attunement. It. Yeah, but, it doesn't you know, do it's, anything. So. It fits the character uh, slot. Yeah, but I, I I like that limiting thing when playing through Star Wars with the one magic item per um, proficiency point. Um. I ran into an issue where I was like, okay, what can I fit into my two open slots? Like, I already got the armor, I already got the weapons, I already got the the cool displacer belt, you know? I'm already hard as crap to hit. I don't have many weaknesses. I can find an item to give me more saves. I have two more slots to put magic items in. So I'm just sticking just dumb bullshit crap and attuning to it, and just, like, it it lost the, the luster that it, that it should have had I if it was just limited to three. I always like third edition's version of it. I, I Truthfully, I want to talk about first and second, but I don't remember how their system worked. I know it wasn't attunement, uh, but third edition, it was basically, you can just have one item in each slot, and it had uh, one for each hand, uh, a body slot, a head slot, neck, uh, boots, gloves. Yeah, ba- ba- uh, I think cloak was a slot, and it didn't matter what the fucking items were. You know, it, it's yeah. it's a non-attunement system. If you pick up, you know, the flaming sword and you know what it does, it works as you want it to work. If you know what the yeah. cloak does, it works as it should. You know, fuck the attunement thing. You just you, if you know what it does, you can wear it. I think I think at that point in time, you're kind of hitting like the the way the Final Fantasy handled their items. Like, okay, here's just all the slots you have. Put whatever you want in them, and you're done. And yep. that that has an old school RPG feel to it, which is fine. Yeah, which is I'm pretty sure that's a straight takeaway from Dungeons and Dragons. I think that's how yeah. First Edition did it too, which is the way Third Edition did it. But like you know, like you look at Final Fantasy VI, you had the, your two hand slots. Final Fantasy so three, six, where you had you could put like two weapons for, in, two for shields in. For all the Americans, in. for all the Americans, Final Fantasy three. Go ahead. 
for everybody from the 90s, it was three. For everybody else, from the 2000s onwards, it's six. Um, <laughs> because Final Fantasy three is now a different game. Go look at Steam. You'll see. Um, I, who the fuck's going to play it on Steam? I'm going to play it on my uh, Nintendo. They all just got remastered. Nintendo. But anyway, go ahead. Well, they all just got remastered. It's the Pixel Edition. I don't care about that. I, I have the Super Nintendo one. I'll just play it where you know, where it originated. So. so six six had the two hand slots, which could be any combination of weapons and shields that you want. And then they had a head slot, and they had a chest slot, and they had two relic slots, which were like rings. That always look like rings to me. Yeah. So, yeah. That, yeah. Two rings, basically. Yeah, and then like you could put speed boots on in one of the relic slots, though. So it was rings or boots, and like that, I like that. That, that that's enough. That's your equipment. That's your magic stuff, and you're looking at six items to kind of like customize, and that's like as far as I would go. But if you're gonna give me my base gear and then have magic items on top of it, I, I'd rather just have it just be like just base gear, and magic items are mixtured into what the base gear is, or give me how fifth edition handles it with the with the two minute slots. I really like the two minute slots. I like the three. I like that you just get them. Maybe you could get a feat in there that gives you an, an additional one, you know, for those who really need that four slot, you know. But shit, my I barely have put any magic items out in my current campaign. Like it's way, way less than my normal amount. Uh, and I already have one player who's already he's having to give away an item because he's already at max on attunement slots at sixth level. So, well, I mean. That can happen. That's part of that's part of what the game is to me. That's part of the like, oh, okay, this is now my agency and the characters. I have to choose where this magic item is going to go. Am I going to hoard it? Am I going to keep it? Am I going to give it to somebody else? Am I going to sell it to somebody else? You know, and or is it just is it just going to be that I'm just going to wear it and you're going to make a rule where everyone can wear it and do the proficiency thing. And now he's just getting more and more and more magic items until he's just uberly equipped. Yeah, and, it, it, it always it does always fall down to the DM as to what you allow to go out. Yeah. I, I, you know, and I the items they have they they have just gotten finally a couple of good items. Yeah. Uh, yeah, all the stuff they had previously is not what I would call powerful, but a couple of them do require attunement. Yeah. For whatever for whatever reason, you know, they're not even rare magic items that require attunement. I that might be a thing. Maybe only rare or higher should require attunement. Well, I mean, there's a couple uncommon that are really good, and there's a couple rare items that are just terrible that <laughs> they shouldn't yeah, have I, an attunement I, slot. Well, they probably shouldn't be rare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it's beneficial to have magic items that don't require attunement. As much as there are that are that do, the one that increase your potency as a character should all require attunements. The ones that are just kind of like magical fun fluff things shouldn't. You know, yeah. if you have, as what happened in my last campaign, last game session actually, if you have a wand that lets you create um, blooming foliage in a five foot square, <laughs> the wand of who wonder. cares? Who cares? Just, just that's that's a non-attunement item. Have fun with it. Good luck. Yeah. Do something creative with it, please. But My that, player, that, item, that you, item that's going to give you plus two to your spell attack rolls and yeah, you know, like pluses on saves or whatever. Yeah, I could see if you're going to use the attunement, you want that to have it. Yeah. Because those are the ones that are going to increase like your shoot. Anything that gives you spells of like maybe first level or higher. Definitely should be required two minutes. I think that's more what needs to be looked at than how many a character has. You know, and that yeah, that that could be a fix for it. It's just a reworking of what requires it. Yeah, I know there's a helmet. Uh, I think it was in the Ghost of Salt Marsh. Let me look it up here real quick. Yeah, so there's a helm of underwater action. It's a rare item. It's a brass helmet. It allows you to breathe underwater, gives you dark vision, the range of 60 feet, and you gain a swimming speed of 30 feet. It requires attunement. And there's also just like an uncommon item that just lets you breathe underwater, which also requires attunement. 
Yeah, see, the, like, that, yeah, the helm I could see requiring it because that's actually really good. Oh, it's um, an amazing. It's like when you're when you're making a uh, if you're uh, munching a character like that's uh, an item you may want to get. You know, an item that just lets you breathe underwater uh, and gives yeah. you dark vision. And no, 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 I, I yeah, yeah, no, that one's good. But the other one that just lets you breathe underwater seems. Why the hell yeah. does that require attunement? You know. I well, I, I think well, this came out in Ghost, and I think it all was just in the player's handbook. Um, but like, there's uh, even, even stuff that just like lets you see, give you dark vision requires attunement. Yeah, which you it, know? that should not be the case. Yeah. So yeah. That's kind of like, especially when you're designing items too. Like this is definitely a power creep item. You know, it definitely makes it yeah, cap of water breathing. <laughs> um, yeah. If, you're, if, if it's a cap of water breathing, I hope it has it, a strap on it because as soon as you go into the water, you're gonna lose that damn thing. Well, it doesn't actually require. This one doesn't require two minutes. It's just another one that's in the DMG. Oh no! Uh, I'm just saying. If, if I'm just saying, if it's a cap. Yeah, if I dive yeah. in with a baseball hat on, I'm gonna lose that baseball hat unless it has a chin, <laughs> unless it's got a chin strap on it. Well, this one, uh, while wearing this cap underwater, you can speak its command word and as an action to create a bubble of air around your head that allows you to breathe normally underwater. The bubble stays with you until you speak the command word again, or the cap is removed, or you're no longer underwater. <laughs> like, like, yeah, so it's like Gillyweed from uh, Harry Potter. What? I forgot you haven't seen it or read it or know anything about it. Any, anyway, if you watch the movies, Gillyweed is this stuff that they chew on that lets them create a bubble of... I think it was... No, maybe that just let them breathe underwater. I'm sorry. One of the uh, people in the movie used a spell that created a bubble of air around them huh. so that they could actually you know, breathe underwater. <sighs> Don't don't ask me to know a lot about Harry Potter. I've I've only ever watched the movies. So, did you know they're coming out with a Harry Potter R- RPG? I figured it was already out. It actually comes out on Tuesday. It's called Strixhaven. <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually figured that was already out a while back. I just you know, haven't been paying attention. No, they they gotta have an actual Harry Potter tabletop. Harry Potter tabletop. No, not tablecloth, tabletop. Hogwarts, an RPG. Nope. Eh, That definitely does not look official. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I don't see anything official. Oh, well. They should get get on that, because you know there's no... uh, their, their fan base is getting older, and since a lot of the new a lot of books aren't coming out about it, that's that's going to be a dying brand at some point. So it's probably too late unless they're going to start making more movies. I mean, at least they didn't pull a Game of Thrones. Oh yeah, where they still haven't finished the books, and some people absolutely detested the ending of that show. I know they just stopped at season five. I don't know no, why. I, I I watched all of it. I did not hate the ending, but I'm apparently one of the few. So, I think endings are some of the hardest things to write as writer, story crafter. Sure. You know. right. And like, like even I like I failed at ending Frost Maiden correctly. Okay, and I tried my best to make up for that with the Owl campaign. Um, so I know that there's a, there's a lot of pressure with making sure the ending is, is satisfactory, whether they win or lose and everyone has a good time and the story is well told and everyone understands what's going on. But at the same time too, I don't think anyone's ever going to be happy with an ending. Now, speaking of shitty endings, did you know that the second matrix movie comes out in a couple of weeks? Uh, yeah, like, it comes out. I think it comes out the same weekend as the next Spider-Man movie. Comes out the weekend after. Okay, that's so, way too close, though. <laughs> well, that's that's actually a good, good, another good example. Like the ending to, to Matrix One is not a cool ending. It, it, it's a very cool ending, 
but it's not a very like logical one. Like it's like it, it done. Neo's broken out of the matrix and somehow some way he can now fly question mark. That was never set up in the film. Now he's just Superman. What's going on? Of course, our little nineties brains were blown away by this fact and just awestruck. You watch it now. You're kind of like, why can't he fly now? I know. I still don't question it. Cause I don't care. Cause the movie's fucking awesome. <laughs> So when they when they came out with the next two movies, they never um, made two more movies. Shush. When they came out for the next two movies, and they tried to like expand the universe and 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 add more story and more layer to it. It just kind of fell flat. You know, Smith was a good villain, but then you're just having this kaiju fight at the end, and it just felt very weird. Like it, there definitely was a bow. It definitely was wrapped. It was a fun spectacle to watch, but if you're gonna rewatch anything, you're only gonna watch Matrix One. That's the only um, one I've ever rewatched. And then, and then to take, then to continue on dropping canonical changes into the video games, side movies, and MMO, like Morpheus. Okay, Morpheus is dead. All right, he's not been in yep. any of the trailers. He's not anywhere. Why? Because he died in a video game, and that was the canonical ending of to Morpheus. Like, Art, how are you going to bring it to the big screen? Are they just going to the, the games now? I don't, I don't know. But they, they, they keep adding more and more and more story to Matrix to kind of like make it justified and bring it back around. Yeah. Um, the current theory is that, like, this new Matrix is, again, another reset world, and they're taking the lessons from the past, and now they're kind of like, oh, yeah, now because... Um, you know, people rallied against us that way. Now the Matrix is like the movie is a franchise, and ha ha ha. That's sort of how we're going to get them this time. It's the normal Hollywood. You know, they don't right. really have new ideas. They only want to rehash the old ones. And you so, like know, this, this overlying Matrix was this... incredibly popular, and they managed to talk Keanu Reeves into doing another one. So, yeah, here we go. There's there's something about the Matrix too, where like like this subtle plot point they keep dropping is like every time that they have a matrix and it resets the previous matrix becomes like the fantasy stories of the previous one that's why like the werewolves and the vampires um are in the matrix as like bad code because in the previous matrix they had one that was just all horror and just death and destruction and it was like innistrad if you get that reference where just yeah. vampires and werewolves are everywhere killing people and murdering people and that one obviously. I don't remember collapsed. that from any of the movies. No, no. Again, it's 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 in it's in the the side stuff. Yeah, but see, that's none weird. of that none of that's fucking canon to me or most people because very few people have seen any of that. And that's that's what I'm trying to say is it's really hard to put a nice bow, a nice ending to the Matrix when you keep adding more and more and more and more story on. And so, like, is this next one going to come out? Is it supposed to reignite the whole thing again? Is it supposed to be a final bow? Is it supposed to be the, the coup de grace to the whole yeah. series? Who, who the hell knows? <laughs> uh, yeah, like I, yeah, the movie The Thing is literally the perfect film. It's fantastic. The ending leaves you wondering what's really happening. And then they did Not a video sure. game. <laughs> they did a video game years later that continues the story. And I'm pretty sure it was supposed to be canon, but. Nobody, I think I'm the only person who ever played the game. So, <laughs> yeah, if they made another movie, they would probably just ignore the video game if they were smart. Well, it's the Wachowski siblings there. I don't know what they are now. Yeah, what, Wachowski the siblings. Watch, Wachowskis or whatever. Yeah, they, they were heavily involved in all the other projects, though. So, uh, it, yeah, I, I, like I'm pretty sure John, yeah, like I think John Carpenter was involved in the video game process. And then, it makes a canon. Yeah, but once again, if they did another film, very few people are familiar with the the other parts of it, so you would just so, ignore it. So, final question for you this evening: Then, what's your favorite canon? Oh, I, I generally like a uh, Civil War style canon. You know, mm -hmm. they're 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 large. They shoot cannonballs. Uh, I've seen a few of them actually fired off at reenactments. Um, what, what about you? Mine is the uh I'm gonna butcher this name. Uh it's the the Schweizer Gustav. Ah. You know what that is? 
No, but it sounds like a World War One or Two cannon, probably World on War a. Two cannon. Right. In English, it's just called the Heavy Gustav, and it was a eighty-seven meter railway gun. Yeah, that I was going to say it's developed. probably on a. Was it on a ship? It was on a railway, hence railway gun. Oh, I've actually seen video of these things. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's a massive, like half mile long <laughs> train. Uh, yeah, it's a 1,490 short tons, um, and it fired seven-ton shells. <laughs> nice. And it essentially just basically just, it was, a, it was a giant cannon on a railway track, and they just obliterated. I'm pretty sure you can watch YouTube footage of it. It's yeah. pretty amazing. Uh, as for uh, my favorite cannon as far as movies go, C-A-N-O-N, uh, definitely Jason X. That's a good movie. It's such a great film, and it's canon, because all of those movies are canon. So is Freddy vs. Jason. I know, exactly. But Jason X, it's the best of all of them. You know, he, he's, still... tur- he's, he's a frozen statue who still manages to chop a guy's arm off, and he manages to bludgeon uh, two... Uh, what were they? Two ladies uh, to death inside of a sleeping bag. Although they weren't act, they they were a uh, simulation, but it's pretty amazing. <laughs> the, the, Jason walked into the hollow projector room. Yes, of Star that, Wars. That, like, thank you. We're, we we're going to distract them, and then they loaded up the Camp Crystal Lake scenario, which is just like a, two girls getting frisky, and they're like, "Oh, this will work." <laughs> and, and next next away. time you next time you see him, he has both of them in a sleeping bag, slamming them into a tree over and over again. So. So he definitely failed his wisdom save. Yes. But did he really? <laughs> oh. he, he's programmed. He has one thing he does. You know, that's, that's kill uh, campers. Um, actually, that kind of brings up an interesting question that I had for you. Um, so if how low is too low a level to put in a character that could um, essentially TPK a party? For example, and the example that the question that was given is, is a party of level twos too early for it to fight a basilisk? What is the CR of the basilisk and how many people in the party? I think it was a party of four. It was a CR of five. Uh, CR six. Remember, anyone that looks at it has got to make a save and petrify. Yeah, but it, it takes two turns to petrify you, and the petrification is not permanent. Not if you fail at a lower amount. Yeah, uh, yeah, if you fail horribly, but yeah. the saves are like the difference between your saves at level two and level five is very minimal. Let me. I, I want to actually look up the stats on said basilisk. Uh, okay, yeah, because we know how the petrifying gaze three. DC twelve Constitution. Yeah, like it's a CR three man. That's 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 an easy fight for a bunch of level twos. But let's mm-hmm. let's just say something at level five, a CR five monster against a group of level twos, four of them. Mm-hmm. Um, it, the damage output is what's going to matter, and sort of the the group, the party makeup. If the party has healing then they can handle a CR5 if they have healing and good damage output. Uh, like, you know, sure, a CR5 might drop somebody every swing or every other swing, but, you know, just numbers. Numbers will always overwhelm. Uh, I, as an example, I ended up running my players this past weekend, and they, they were still on the uh, escort mission, where they had a whole bunch of level one hobgoblin monks with them. And those Hobgoblin monks were fighting against CR5 to CR8 monsters along with the PCs. While they were not, if it was just them, they would have died, obviously. But with the support from the players and everything, those monks were able to actually do damage and actually survived the entire session. And they were consistently putting out, you know, 30 damage every round between the five of them. So I, I feel that like a CR, a group of CR2s with, you know, competent players with good support can beat CR5 or even CR6 monsters pretty reasonably consistently. 
Yeah. Um, I know, I think it's uh, Lost Minds of Phantom Delver that has the, the young green dragon in it. Um, when they're like level three or four ish. Yeah. Um, but I like, look that up, uh, young green dragon. I remember we fought it. Um, and I had, I had, I didn't know it was even there that we'd be fighting, fighting it. We tried to talk to it and, you know, we were gonna. I was gonna try to do the whole like, yeah, it's, yeah. We brought you five sacrifices and point at the cultists. I was gonna try that. Yeah. But it decided to basically do its poison breath attack on us immediately and just kind of ruined my day. Yeah. If if yeah, at that level, doable. Yes, but man, that poison breath is gonna. That sucks. That's twelve d six with a DC fourteen con save. Yeah. I mean, and dragons too don't really ever lose if you play them right. So. Oh sure, if it flies off, you're just you're boned. It'll fly by and just drop the poison breath on you. Yep. Um, but at least with with that encounter, even though you're going to be completely underprepared for it, that's like a team of level fours, I think, or something like that, or even lower, maybe three. Yeah. You're given ample opportunity and time, and like it, the monster is set ahead of time. So to kind of answer the person's question, it's like if you want to introduce a monster that is going to be the death of them. Okay. Then you got to give them plenty of like pre knowledge lead up to that in the Al campaign for my, for my other example, for my personal example, the, the final boss of the, the castle is a full grown for Morgan. That's also a mage. All right. And the reason why I kind of I, w- I wanted to have a full Fomorian, but I needed someone that could actually run the rituals, so I had to make him a mage. And the Fomorian stat block is just really just giant with club, smashy, smashy, and you're done. Right. So I kind of had to come up with this backstory of why the Fomorians are even there to begin with. And, you know, buy my campaign book when it comes out and you'll get the full story. But essentially, this guy knows he's a giant. He has a mage. Green flame blade on a weapon of his, on his club. It's essentially more deadly than magic missiles at a level one spell slot for him, you know? Yeah. Um, so he knows that even as, as a mage, his, his primary damage source is still hitting people, but then he just casts fireball for fun, you know, but there's plenty of lead up to that guy. Like, Hey, you're fighting giant skeletons. Hey, you're fighting <laughs> these incredible spell casters about this entire encounter that are pulling out spells that you have not seen before that are not in any book that just blow your mind and how they operate. Oh, by the way, here's more giants. Here's undead giants at you. So yep. when you actually get to the final encounter, like, Oh, a giant mage kind of putting it all together at the very end. And if you hadn't prepared yourself by then for that, then you die. In the, in the case for the basilisk is, is like, make sure you, the players see, petrified people hanging out yeah, yeah. in front uh, of the cave. Give them an idea that what's inside, you know? Yep. Uh, yeah, all, all of the stuff from the uh, Advanced 5e tools, if you start looking over all of the monsters, it actually gives you a whole bunch of signs that there is a certain type of monster in the area. So. Yeah. Advanced 5e. Yep. One day I'll get the stuff that I buy off of Kickstarter. I'm still waiting for dice that I bought three years ago. Oh, Lord. Uh, I'm still waiting for a board game I bought about three years ago. I'm pretty sure I'm never going to see it. So Yeah. The Ouroboros book. Um, the Advanced 5e stuff isn't coming anytime soon. Um, they, I just got, we got an email today saying that the, they redid the PDFs and made a bunch of fixes. So they're halting the product line and reprinting the books the right way. So lovely. Yeah. The books won't be here for a while. Yeah. I, I'm still waiting on yeah, It's going to be the end of next year before I get the ones I ordered as well. So, but anyway, I don't really have much more to go on about this time. I do. Have you ever heard the concept of so long? The grumpiness has been your friend. Now go and spread anger through D&D. No, don't do that. Be happy, be friendly, be awesome. 
uh, but maintain the boiling hate that inside your heart. I don't know, buddy. I'm rambling at this point. Shut me up and end this podcast.